Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for showing up. I like to uh, get a good idea of who I'm talking to. So how many people in the audience are students right now? Who's a student? A lot of students. Who is an independent game developer that is not a student, like an ex-student? OK. How many of you have been independent game developers for more than two years? OK. How many of you have worked on a project for longer than two years? All right, so ever diminishing yes answers to those questions. Um, anyway, so the subject of my talk today is about how to do uh, deep work in game development and what that means, I'll define, um, and how to survive a long project. Um, it sort of sounds like two different topics, but as I was writing this talk, I found them kind of inextricable. You know, when you try to do uh, deep work, you get ambitious, your project gets long, and then you run into all these problems that we'll talk about. Um, this is going to be a pretty weird talk. And the reason is because I sat down and said, OK, what, you know, what's the best advice that I can give people about how to do well at developing games? that's really advice that they're not going to hear somewhere else. You know, you can go and hear advice about here's how to program well, or here's how to get started programming, or here's how to get started modeling and texturing. Uh, however, it is, um, you know, I sit down and think about it, and I realize that while all those foundational skills are pretty important, they're actually a relatively small percentage of what the skills are that I find to be necessary to succeed from day to day in ambitious projects. So I tried to focus on what are some of these skills that you don't necessarily hear about or think about, um, and what, what are they like? So uh, the disclaimer is that everything that I'm going to say here is about my personal way of development. I'm not saying this is the only way to do things. I'm not saying you should do things this way. I'm just here to say what works for me. Because you know sometimes people come up and they ask, how do I do the kind of thing that you do? And I often don't know how to answer that question. And this is sort of the first attempt to really answer that question. So let me talk about what deep work is, right? Um, what does that mean? Uh, and I'm going to define it sort of by the characteristics that deep work might have. Not all deep work has all of these characteristics. They're just ways of dancing around the subject to tell you what we're talking about. Um, I think the primary characteristic is that deep work changes you. Um, now, whenever I say work or, or anything like that, I primarily think of myself as a designer these days. So I might say design once in a while and whatever, because I'm thinking of myself. But what I'm talking about really applies to all subjects. It applies to programming. It applies to modeling and texturing, uh, production, you know, business management, all these things, right? So if you do deep work in any of these areas, you are a different person at the end than you were at the beginning, and you're better at what you do in a substantial way, not just an incremental way, but a, um, a way that is different in character. So an example, um, this is a game I made called Braid. And when I was making this game, I learned a lot about puzzle design. I learned a lot about how puzzles can communicate and how a good puzzle is very clear about what it's about, right? And it doesn't have obfuscating elements. And I learned about how you can turn a really strong puzzle into a weak puzzle just by some small rearrangements and a few obfuscating elements, right? And that the things that work best and strongest are often the most beautiful. So um, that was a really strong learning experience. And it's something that I take with me now after this game into everything that I design forevermore, right? It's changed who I am as a game design practitioner. So now I'm working on this game called The Witness, and I've taken this idea about puzzles in Braid, and I've launched on another exploration. It's like, well, what happens if instead of trying to communicate little tiny one-off ideas, I try to build longer streams of nonverbal communication? You know, what? how rich and complex 
I, of ideas can I communicate to the player non-verbally, right? That's a thing that I explored and have learned from The Witness, and now in every game that I go on after this, I will take that with me. So another characteristic, though, aside from the fact that it changes you, is that when you start out, you don't know where you're going. Right? When I started out making Braid, I didn't know that I was going to try and make these little jewel-like puzzles that communicated clearly in a minimalistic way. I found my way there somehow, right? but I didn't, I didn't know what it was. Right? The way that I found my way there was with some guiding compass. I had some idea of what I think is interesting or beautiful or just that I would like to see, something, something that feels good about games to me, and I just followed that and followed that until I got to the good ideas, right? Um, this guiding compass has to be something internal. It has to be something that you are interested in, right? A, a good guiding compass for doing deep work is not something like, what do I think is going to appeal to women ages 30 to 45, right? That's a terrible guiding compass unless you're trying to build an industrial product, which is not really what I'm talking about today. Um, when you do a lot of deep work, it makes you into a unique specialist because, as I've said, you're following your guiding interest, you're setting out for a destination unknown. When you get there, you'll be somewhere that probably very few people have gone. You'll understand something very intimately that probably very few people in the world understand. So if you're a programmer, you're suddenly a specialist programmer. If you're a designer, you're a specialist designer. If you're a modeler, you're a specialist modeler. Um, whether that's good or not is an open question, right? In one sense, maybe it makes you uh, more of a world-class, you know, look up to kind of game development person. In another sense, maybe it isolates you from other people in your field. It's unclear. Um, it's unclear in advance. You sort of only find out by doing it yourself. Um, now, the other thing about deep work is that people from day to day don't really seem to believe in it. You know, they, people are kind of too busy to believe that they're doing something big or important a lot of the time. Um, so they, there's this cultural thing that, that many of us do where we sort of think down on what we're doing or we set our expectations low so that they're societally acceptable, right? So most people uh, don't even believe that something deep that changes you is something that you can do from day to day uh, in a field like video games. It doesn't make sense in their brain. So most people don't know that the kind of work I'm talking about exists. Um, but it, but it does, right? And if you if you do it, um, in addition to making you some kind of unique specialist, it's just going to set you apart from everybody in your field because the kind of thing that you do fundamentally is very different from the kind of thing that they do fundamentally. And we'll go into that in a little more detail later. Now, I want to say that I'm not just talking about game mechanics. I want to reiterate this, right? I mean, I think of myself as a designer, and whenever I talk about exploration or finding new ideas. We have this kind of mechanics fetishism that we've gotten into in the past five years where people think that means coming up with some new gameplay mechanic and then implementing that and whatever. That could be a thing that you do. It's a thing that I do sometimes. But really here I'm talking about an entire game as a whole coherent work, right? Any aspect of the game, visuals, design programming, all aspects of the game together at once, right? I'm talking about deep, introspection on the entire work. So to take an example of what that might feel like in another field, I have this quote from Paul Cezanne, um, who was a painter. So the game equivalent of that might be someone who's a modeler or a texturer. And he talked about painting something very simple like a carrot. And he said, the day is coming when a single carrot freshly observed will set off a, resolution, a re revolution. Um, it's a very strong statement. I mean, think, what is he even talking about, right? Like, what, what level of depth of practice of his craft can he even be talking about when he says, the day is coming when a single carrot, freshly observed, will set off a revolution? Um, 
you, you can think about that for a while. Uh, this is actually part of a, of a longer quote that people uh, refer to a little less often, but he's talking about painting a carrot um, in contrast to this sort of uh, factory production type of art that was being taught at that time and saying, you know, these people get taught to do these sort of slavish techniques, but the real value, the thing that'll create the revolution um, lies in this deep individual vision. Now, to paint a carrot does not take very much. You know, uh, it, it requires experience as a painter, but um, anyone can paint a carrot, right? The magic that you bring to it is is in your, your technique and in the way that you see the world. So you don't need a lot of tools. You don't need like an expensive lab to paint a carrot or to do any kind of deep work, right? So deep work can be done from first principles. Okay, so here's two games where I feel like I did pretty deep work, and by the way, that's another characteristic of it, is that it's subjectively judged by you. I'm not saying that anyone in the world has to believe that anything that I did was deep, but it's deep to me. I learned a lot from it. Um, so there's this game Braid uh, that I worked on for three and a half years. That's kind of a long time. Um, there's a ga another game that I'm working on now called The Witness. It's not done yet. By the time it's done, it will have been between five and a half or six years. That's really pretty a long time. I mean, I imagine that most of the people who are students, even the prospect of working on something for two years seems like a really long time. So how do you deal with this? Uh, well, um, there's a lot to say about that. I will say that um, these, uh, these developments were long not for any terrible reason. Like there, there was never any kind of disaster that happened like you hear in games sometimes like, oh, we started building the game and things went wrong and we had to destroy it and fire half the team and rebuild. None of that happened. Like both of these were successful developments that were productive the entire time. It's just that three and a half years or five and a half years is how long it actually took to explore the subject matter at hand and then to present it to the player in a way that does justice to the material. And that's a lot of work. So, you know, deep projects turn into long projects. However, I don't want to sit here and evangelize long projects to you. I don't want to sit here and say you should take three to five years on a project because there's big downsides to that, right? If the reason you are making a game is to get it out there in the world and so other people can you know, benefit from the experience of playing your game, then it makes sense that the more games you can make in your limited career, uh, the more good stuff you bring to the world. So then obviously the shorter your development cycle, the better. But there's just a correlation between depth of work and length of work. And so um, there's some kind of balance to be struck, right? You, you sort of need to decide how long of a project you want to do or you can do and then figure out how deep you can go within that time limit. So those games that I showed were not actually my first game. My first professional game was this thing. Um, this also was a 3.5 year development uh, starting in 1996. It was a multiplayer uh, 3D first person action strategy war game over like 9600 baud modems. It was very, very ambitious. It was very technically sophisticated. The design was kind of crazy and did things that a lot of games hadn't done. So it was very, it was very avant-garde. It was very forward-thinking. But I wouldn't characterize it as deep, right? And it's hard to say why, even now. And all I can really think is that maybe at this point of my career, I just wasn't ready to do something deep yet. I wasn't really ready to do a high quality exploration, right? But even though I wouldn't characterize this as deep, it was very, very good um, as a way of training myself to get good at video games. So you don't, you don't always have to be deep to make progress. Like maybe sometimes 
you need to work hard to get make progress to get to a place where then you can then start doing this kind of uh, like self redefining work that I'm talking about. So, so now how do you do it? Like practically speaking, if you want to do something deep that changes you, that you learn tremendously from, you're going to need a lot of really good ideas because games are big and they're complicated and there's a lot of ideas in games and if most of your ideas are relatively pedestrian, if most of the ideas are the kinds of ideas that everybody else has, you're not going to do something very deep, right? You're going to make a game that looks a lot like everybody else's game. So the question is, from day to day, how do you get these ideas that you then turn into a game? And this is where the advice starts getting weird. Because honestly, for me, what I do sometimes when I want to have good ideas is I go take a shower, right? Or I just wake up in the morning and there's a new idea in my head, right? Or, you know, I'm walking uh, back to the office after having lunch and I haven't been thinking about things for a while and I have a new idea and I think it's brilliant and I'm like, oh, I really want to follow that up. So how does that happen, right? And how do you, how do you make that happen? Uh, how, how do you facilitate this kind of idea having, right? Um, this is not a new observation that this is the way that deep creativity happens, right? Uh, it's been known for thousands of years. The Greeks had this concept that there were muses who were a range of goddesses who would go and plant ideas into the minds of, of poets and musicians. And uh, if you were lucky and the muses smiled upon you, you would be able to create something good. And if you weren't, uh, then you might be sort of destitute uh, that day or that week or that month. Um, these days, we don't tend to think of creativity quite this way. I don't think the ancient Greeks had postulated a muse of game design, so they didn't give us much of a head start. Um, we tend to think of this kind of creativity in other ways, but that bears similarities to this model. And sort of the, the things that I want to point out are that these ideas, these very strong, very creative ideas, for all intents and purposes, feel like they come from outside. Um, in other words, uh, the concept of the muse is operationally real. Like from day to day, you might as well behave as though these creative ideas are out there in the universe somewhere and they're not inside you yet. And you attempt to make yourself ready to receive those ideas. Because whatever your model is, you know, maybe your model is, well, these creative ideas come from deep in my subconscious mind, and I don't know it, but it's grinding on these ideas when I'm sleeping, and then I'll wake up, and they'll pop out. And, and that's true, but functionally, it's still the same. This idea is somewhere that you're not conscious of, and then it pops into your consciousness, and it's not even necessarily related to anything that you were thinking about. So. Um, let me talk about some other perspectives on this kind of thing that are more contemporary. Uh, this is Y Combinator founder Paul Graham. Uh, and he has an essay called The Top Idea in Your Mind from 2010, where he says, it's hard to do a really good job on anything you don't think about in the shower. Everyone who's worked on difficult problems is probably familiar with the phenomenon of working hard to figure something out, failing, and then suddenly seeing the answer a bit later while doing something else. There's a kind of thinking that you do without trying to. I'm increasingly convinced that this type of thinking is not merely helpful in solving hard problems, but necessary. And, uh, you know, uh, Paul's job as the head of Y Combinator is to, uh, you know, help put startups together and tutor them and, and get them launched successfully. So. This covers all ranges of discipline. Like when he talks about solving problems, he's talking about programming, product design, high concept ideas, like getting funded, right? All these things. Um, he's, you know, he's explaining it in terms of a model that's more about thought and that this generation of these ideas is a certain kind of thinking, but it still has the same properties, right? You're doing it without trying to, you're not aware of the creative idea, and then it shows up magically. David Lynch uh, has another way of talking about the same kind of thing, right? He's a relatively 
famous film director. Hopefully you know who he is. And he has a book called Catching the Big Fish, in which he talks about meditation and its relation to his creativity. And he says, ideas are like fish. If you want to catch little fish, you can stay in the shallow water. But if you want to catch the big fish, you've got to go down deeper. Down deep, the fish are more powerful and more pure. They're huge and abstract, and they're very beautiful. So again, he's explaining it in a different way. He's got a different model. But again, the ideas are out there somewhere. And you can't see them until you catch the fish. And then you've got one. So how do you do that? right? How do you encourage uh, these fish to show up, or the muse to speak to you, or this kind of strange thought that you're not in control of? right? If you're not in control, what can you do? Um, and the, general piece of advice, which I'll make more specific, is you want to do things that put your mind into a relaxed mode that is ready to receive these ideas. Um, the relaxation is important. We'll get into that. Uh, for me, well, and, and for anyone vaguely like me, one of my more concrete recommendations is to find a physical hobby that you enjoy that you like doing on a regular basis, maybe a few days a week. Uh, for me, that hobby uh, was always going out dancing. You know, even back in the 1990s, when I uh, was working on that first game that you saw, um, I would go out to nightclubs. I'd be dancing, you know, until 2 AM or whenever they close in the US. And very quickly, I discovered that I'd be having ideas every time I sat down and take a break. And so I started bringing a notebook with me out to the dance club. and. Sometimes I'd forget it and lose it, especially if I drank a little too much. And sometimes, you know, someone else would spill a drink on it, and it would get all messed up. But it was still generally a successful uh, practice. And I would uh, often have ideas back then about programming um, that I could then go the next day and implement. Um, it, was, it was a great way to just get, you know, like new angles on what I was thinking about that were slightly, uh, slightly different. Than, than what I would think about logically over the course of the day. Now, the reason I say something physical here is there's other benefits to that that are going to help out later when we talk about long projects. Uh, for example, if your body's a little bit healthier, you'll have better emotions arising by default from hour to hour, day to day. If your emotional state is more robust, you'll get less sad and depressed about how sucky game development gets sometimes. And we all have a hard time with that, right? So. Um, now, I don't exactly know what the parameters of this are. I've done some things that work better and some things that don't work as well. So for example, I've spent many, many, many hours martial arts training, but I don't get the same kind of idea flow from that. It might be that it's not as fun. It might be that it doesn't relax me as much, or it might just be that I'm using my mind in a different way there, like I'm explicitly trying to learn and get better at things all the time. And so maybe that doesn't free up that part of my mind to, to relax and sit back. I don't, I don't know exactly, but I've just found that some things work better and some things work not as well. Um, now, I did an experiment, actually, because if I was going to come up on stage and tell a bunch of people, no, really, this is how you get good ideas to make games with, then I should be able to do it on demand. Uh, so you know, last Thursday, I was in San Francisco, and I was working in a cafe. And I had been sitting there for four or five hours, drafting out the outline for what I was going to talk about today. And I had you know, the outline of a speech, but I wasn't totally satisfied with it. Uh, I, I didn't feel like it had enough stuff in it. And so I said, well, it's getting late. I'm going to go out dancing. Uh, but let me do this explicitly as a technique. right? Let me do this idea generation as a technique. So I took a couple of napkins. I stuffed them in my pocket because I didn't have a good notebook. I drove to Berkeley. I went dancing. I was having a great time. I sat down to take a break, had forgotten that I had these napkins in my pocket, forgotten that I decided to explicitly do this. But as soon as I sat down, it was like, boom, idea, boom, another idea, right? So I started writing them down. And then I took a break, or I went back dancing, took another break later, started writing some more down. And so this is just a little cell phone screenshot of all the ideas that came to me that one night of dancing, it's quite substantial. It was everything else that I needed for this speech. Um, so like I said, I think there's something about enjoyment 
that makes this happen because, because when you're enjoying yourself, when you're satisfied with what you're doing in the current moment, you're not like reaching out in the world to seek other things like, oh, if, if I were talking to that person, I'd be happier right now, right? Or if I had a delicious sandwich, I would be happier right now. You're not having that kind of thought when you're doing something that you're enjoying. And so in the aftermath of that enjoyment, you're still satisfied and your mind can relax and sit back into this restive mode where these kinds of ideas come. Now the other thing that I've learned is that if I try to control this too much, it doesn't work. So a couple of times I felt under pressure, like, oh, I'm really behind on working on this part of my game and I need some really good ideas for that. So I'm gonna go away for the weekend on like a quiet retreat center and I'm gonna just have a relaxing weekend and take care of myself and, and I'm gonna make a lot of these ideas happen on schedule and when I get back, uh, I'll be ready to do more work. And, and that doesn't really work. Like something about demanding them to happen on time makes them not happen. And yet this experiment that I was just talking about worked because I wasn't really demanding it. I was just like, oh, this will be cool if this works. So you're not in control, right? I don't, I don't wanna, I don't wanna put forth the illusion that you're in control, but you can set up conditions that are favorable to this kind of idea reception. Other things you can do to help it happen. You know, sometimes if you're working on a very complicated game, it, it takes a long time to make things happen because games are pretty big. But, you know, if I want to program something, maybe I can't do that yet because I'm busy doing all these other things. And anyway, to, to add this part requires, uh, you know, all this other infrastructure that hasn't been built. So we can't do it for a couple months, right? If you're modeling a character and you have an idea for how the style of this character will be, and you don't like have animation transitioning working in the engine yet and the programmers say it'll be done in two weeks and it takes two months, you can't try that idea, right? And so those ideas sit in your mind and, and you know, at least for me, I keep juggling them like, oh yeah, I, I'm gonna try this thing. I think this is gonna solve, it. yeah, that, I've got, I'm, I'm gonna try that thing, right? And when you have enough of those flying around, I find that they block the window so that new ideas can't come in. And so one of the best things I can do for generating new ideas is to clear out the old ones, right? Is to just force my way through, make enough time that I'm just gonna go through that old list and try everything I was uncertain about, decide yes or no, am I really gonna try all these vague ideas and thoughts that are lined up and just crank through them. And always, as soon as I'm done cranking through those, a new period of creativity starts. So that's what you can do to help this. There's lots of things you can do to sabotage it. And unfortunately, they're very common things. The first thing you can do to sabotage creativity and game development is make a schedule. Um, the reason for that is because, like I said, if you're doing this kind of deep work, you're setting out for somewhere, you don't know the destination, if you don't know the destination, you can't know the path there or even how far away it is or how long the path is or what obstacles may be in the way. You can't make a schedule for an unknown destination. You simply have to set out and say, we'll get there when we get there, right? However many of us have material constraints, like we only have a certain amount of money or we only have a certain amount of time, how you reconcile that is sort of a problem that everybody has to come up with on their own. Usually the approach is to make a schedule. I do not recommend that. Scheduling kills creativity. Uh, number two, childproofing, uh, which is sort of a new term. I asked around on Twitter uh, for a name for this and somebody came up with the name childproofing, right? Which is when you go around your house and you put all this stuff on all the cabinets and the doorknobs to like make everything in the house safe for the child. Um, but what this means in game design is when you go through the game, or, or any, any part of a game, you go through the game and you sort of shave off all the sharp edges and make sure that nothing too scary or disruptive is in there, right? So, so you know, childproofing is in design when you say, oh, this is a really great design idea and it really complements these other ideas and it's something I really want to get at, but I think people are gonna think it's kind of weird 
and I don't think they're going to quite understand it. And I also think that the, the puzzle that comes from this or the gameplay situation that comes from this isn't going to be very fun for a lot of people. So I'm going to water it down, or I'm going to take it out, or I'm going to do a version that's not as serious, right? When you do that, you hurt the game in two ways, right? Um, one way is that the actual implementation of these creative ideas that you're supposedly following to this destination you're, you're veering away from that path, right? Because you're sort of scared to walk on the path. And over time, the more and more of it you can do, the further away that you get from the actual place the game is trying to go. Um, but secondly, it puts you in a, in a mindset that is very uh, difficult for successful, um, successful pursuit of creativity. Because if you're always second guessing your ideas, thinking, what are people going to think of these ideas? Um, you're not trusting the ideas. You're not, you're not seeing the inherent value in the ideas, and that's very damaging. Um, you know, a visual arts version of childproofing, for example, is like, oh, I've built this location. I see it as very beautiful, but I'm scared that people are going to think it's ugly because the aesthetic that I'm going for is, is somewhat uh, an acquired taste, right? So I, I'm going to change it so that people will appreciate it. You don't, you don't want to do that kind of thing. But doing that is considered a best practice of game development, right? Like people teach you to do that because that's how you make a game that appeals to people. All right, so the, the third way uh, to sabotage yourself is to chase success um, and have uh, team politics. Uh, first, let me talk about chasing success. We'll go back to Paul Graham again, who says, uh, it's hard to get money. He's talking about fundraising for a startup, right? It's hard to get money. It's not the sort of thing that happens by default. It's not going to happen unless you let it become the thing you think about in the shower. And then you'll make little progress on anything else you'd rather be working on. He's talking about the dangers of worrying about money. This is a guy whose job is to launch startups that get venture capital. He's talking about how terrible and poisonous it is to worry about money, right? That should clue you in that it's, it's a thing to be very careful with, right? So, um, you know, in games, you know, sometimes we try to raise money, but, but more often the worry is just how successful is this going to be as a product, right? Are, are a lot of people going to buy it? Or, or, you know, maybe is it going to be critically acclaimed, right? What Metacritic is this game going to get? And when you start worrying about that too much, you're seeing your creative output in terms of what are other people going to think of my thing? How are other people going to judge me for having done my thing this way? And that mindset takes you away from the actual creativity, right? It, it sort of puts you and the creativity uh, at odds with each other because you have to, you know, you have to fight it a little bit. You have to make sure it conforms to this shape that you think will be successfully judged. And then the reason team politics is here is because that's the same thing on a smaller scale. What are other people on the team going to think if I do this thing this way, right? What thing can I do to make other people on the team like me? And whatever, poisonous, very poisonous. Stay away if you can. Um, anyway, uh, the thing is that all these things are very common, most game developers do them. So the way to sabotage potential for deep work is to do game development the way that most people do it, on a schedule, uh, chasing success, because almost by definition, culturally, if you start a company, the assumption is you're trying to make the company uh, profitable. Um, you know, and childproofing because that's, you know, you're making a product for people and so you want to make sure that they like it, right? And what I'm saying is all those things are things that you don't want to do. You know, you, you want to be aware of your audience, but you don't want to, um, you don't want to compromise what you're building for some vision in your head of what the audience is that's actually not even a real thing anyway. All right, a uh, fourth way to sabotage is distractions. This is one that I have problems with all the time, actually. So when you're in a mode of, of relaxation or receptiveness or deep creativity, um, the easiest way to get pulled out of that is for someone to walk up to you and ask you a question. Like, hey, what, what should I do on this one thing? Bam, whatever train of thought you were in is, is gone. Um, Programmers are actually pretty familiar with this because in programming you get into a kind of a flow state where you're visualizing this very abstract structure in your head 
and you lose it. Um, but it happens, it happens for everybody. It doesn't have to be people coming up and talking to you. It could be like an instant messenger program in the corner and like it blinks because someone sent you a message and you glance down there and it interrupts what you were doing. But a lot of people work this way. Um, I, I don't think it's productive. Um, the problem that I personally have is that at my company, uh, we have an open plan office, right? Where there's one open room and everybody has little tables around where they have workstations and anybody can turn and talk to anybody at any time. And I did it that way on purpose because the idea was, well, we're making this game that's supposed to be following my creative vision. And so communication should be uh, prized very carefully, right? Um, anyone should be able to ask me stuff at any time and I'll make myself as available as possible. What I found is this is actually really terrible if you actually want to do anything creative because you can't, you can't ever get into any kind of a deep, uh, you can't get that relaxation, right? You can't get that comfort that now I'm gonna make something and I won't be interrupted. Because what I found is that even the threat that I know it that somebody is probably gonna turn around and ask me something, because this has happened every day for the past two weeks, right? Even that threat will prevent me from getting the relaxation that I need, um, even if it doesn't actually end up happening, even if nobody interrupts me. So whenever I need to do something particularly engaging in our open plan office, I either go sneak off into a separate room or actually go work at a cafe that day. You know, there's a cafe where I feel very comfortable. I just work there and I say, sorry guys, I'll come in later. And eh, it's a little weird to have head of your company not show up that often, but it's kind of what I need to do to solve these problems. Um, all right, so that's the deep work part. Uh, let's talk about how this dovetails with long projects. Um, because as I said, the two are correlated. Um, now, a minute ago, I said that scheduling is bad for creativity, but also, if you want to finish a project, at some point, you probably do need to make a schedule and organize your team and, and make things happen, because that's, that's how you build something complicated. So there's a project management point, right? In order to prevent your project from being too long, you do introduce a schedule at some point near the end, when all the creative decisions have been made, and you're down to execution, there's really no such thing as all the creative decisions have been made, but most of them, all the hard problems are solved, you're down to execution, um, that's when the schedule comes in, right? So there's a time that you shift gears in order to crank and finish, um, but during that time, and actually earlier during the whole project, be careful to avoid burnout. Burnout is the primary danger of long projects. It's a real thing. Burnout is not like, I feel bummed and I kind of don't want to work today. Um, it's an injury, right? I've had this injury. I was working on that first game, I burned myself out. I couldn't work at full productivity for 14 years. I didn't get better until last year, right? All that time, now I managed to make braid while I was working at 50 to 60% productivity, so that's not terrible, but, um, you know, burnout is, is something that you want to avoid if you can. Um, so let's talk about what burnout is, right? Burnout, burnout is, I'm sort of doing this in the wrong order. Uh, so I'll skip instead and say my, my strategy for dealing with burnout is to manage the human animal uh, that is that is inside me, right? We're all human beings. Human beings evolved to have certain strategies that increase survival value uh, in some environment 100,000 years ago, right? That is not necessarily very much like our environment today. Um, but, but a lot of those needs still translate today and, and um, they sound like, right, I want physical comfort is something your human animal says, right? I don't feel very comfortable right now. I want to feel more comfortable. I want external validation, right? I want other people to think that I'm smart or, or think that I'm cool. Um, or it might say, you know, I, I'm not getting enough physical or emotional connection right now. I need more of that. How do I get that, right? You, there's something in us that, that when it isn't getting these things, it has this very animal level reaction. Like my needs are not being satisfied 
And so I feel very bad about that, right? And managing that is important, right? And burnout is what happens when you don't manage that, right? So burnout is a discordancy between the rational mind and the intuitive mind, right? Your rational mind says, working on this project is a really interesting idea. It's got all this cool stuff about it. I want to sit down and, and, and do this thing. And the intuitive part of, part of your mind, which is very much closer connected to the, your body, says, dude, what are you talking about? You just spent a year working on a project that was a total disaster, and you didn't get any external validation for it, and you didn't get any physical or emotional comfort for it. You were lonely the whole time because you were in front of a computer. I'm not going to let you do that again. That was a terrible idea. But that part of you can't verbalize, right? So it just comes out as feelings. So your rational mind says, oh, I'm going to sit down and, and work today. And then instead of working, your hand magically goes to the web browser, and you spend like two hours reading some crappy web page that you don't even want to read, right? That's what uh, burnout is. Now, even if you don't have it seriously, it's something that's going to build because human beings did not, involve, did not evolve in this environment of working in front of a computer all the time, especially for years. And so there's some part of you that never can understand why that's a good idea. As much as your rational mind can say it's a good idea, oh, look at all these things that I did successfully, right? Or these things that other people did successfully that I can, I can do just as well as them. You can, you can make all these stories up, but part of you will never understand that, right? And as you start a project, the longer the project gets, the more this other part of you says, hey, when, uh, when are we going to be done with this, right? When are we going to be back to these kind of creature comforts that I'm looking for? And so when I say that slide about managing the human animal, it's about dealing with this discordancy that builds up and builds up over the course of a project, right? And how do you do that? Um, for me, uh, you know, I don't know. Is simple, stupid things like sometimes, like I'll just go and buy some nice new clothes that I think look nice on me, right? Um, it's not that intellectually I think that that matters at all, right? Like, oh, it's some clothes. I guess that's fun to wear. It's not very important. But some part of me responds to that, right? Some part of me says, oh, yeah, you're, you're taking care of, of these kinds of needs, right? Um, part of it is just going out and spending time with friends, even though I ostensibly don't really enjoy that that much, right? Um, because part of you says, like, OK, hey, you're, you're, being, you're being social. That's not that terrible. Right. Um, so I actually, a big part of my job as a game developer is to manage this part of my psychology. Right. This is not something that I've ever heard anyone else talk about, but it is super important. You can't really get through a long project productively without doing this. Right. You'll burn out at some point in the middle unless you have superhuman abilities, which is sort of the next subject. Not really, but. Um, so, so the previous strategy I was talking about was uh, you know, comforting your human animal. The other thing you can do is get a little more distance from it, right? Um, I have found meditation practices to be a very, very good way to do this. There's a lot of different kinds of meditation out there in the world. I'm not even going to attempt to say anything specific about any of them, um, but I will say that you know, I'm in year five of working on this game, The Witness, and if I did not meditate on a semi-regular basis, I don't think that I would be handling it very well, right? I think that I would have gone crazy. Um, so this is a very useful technique, and, and what it does is it reduces the loudness of those kind of human-animal problems. If you've got some complaint like, oh, I feel lonely because I'm sitting in front of a computer right now, or Nobody's going to appreciate this thing that I'm doing, right? Um, or, uh, you know, like in Indie Game, the movie, it's full of all these shots of, like, you know, developers in the midst of crisis. And it's like, oh my god, life is terrible right now. You know, th this game sucks and it's never going to be done and nobody's going to like it, right? That's a whole story that your mind is telling you. And what meditation lets you do is get some distance and perspective on that story. And what inevitably happens 
when you have distance and perspective on that story is you stop, you observe your situation from first principles, not what the story is telling you, but you look at, hey, what's really going on right now, today, this second, right now? Is, it, is this really terrible? Does this really suck? Is this game really bad? Um, the answer is inevitably no, it's not. Things are fine. Things are always fine, right? And it's very comforting to be able to go back to that perspective at any time. And again, it would be, it would be really difficult for me to have survived my current development without that. You get a smoother ride through all these difficult times. So uh, let me say something that may, I mean, some people get a little nervous when you talk about things like meditation. I'm going to say something even worse than that. So if you're about to embark on a long project, you might ask yourself the question, how do I know this is the right idea, right? If I'm going to spend years on this project, how do I know it's the right thing? How do I know I'm going to stick to it and get it done? So I came up with this thing that I sort of facetiously called the cry test, which is just imagine you're in a very safe place with somebody you care a lot about, you have a very intimate relationship with this person, you're very comfortable with them, and you start explaining to them what this project is that you want to do, right? If you're not in danger of breaking out in tears, not even necessarily in sadness, not even necessarily breaking out in tears, but having some involuntary upwelling of emotion, right? If that's not going to happen in that kind of situation, this probably isn't a project that you're that committed to. Because to do a really long project, that drive needs to be very deep. Um, it needs to come from your core, right? If it doesn't, then what's gonna happen is you start working on this thing, six months later, like, like, oh, I have a really neat idea for a game. It's got a grappling hook and stuff, right? That sounds neat. And then you start working on the grappling hook and stuff, and it turns out to be harder than you thought, right? And not as good as you thought. And six months later, you're like, well, you know, what if I had a jetpack instead, right? And it'll just go like that, right? You'll drop one thing and pick up another thing and drop that thing and pick up another thing uh, in a chain because you're not that committed, right? To succeed in a long and difficult project, there has to be love in the idea. And I don't, you know, in, in English we toss around the word, word love all the time, like we say like, I love pizza or something, but I don't mean that, right? I don't mean I love this idea as in, oh, it's such a great idea. I mean, I love this idea in the way that if I don't do it, I'm gonna feel like, I, like I'm not doing the purpose of my life, right? It has to be that strong. So the, the problem is that most people don't know how to find something that strong in game development. Um, you certainly don't get taught that in school, so at least not any school I've ever seen. So I just encourage uh, some deep introspection. Just try, try, ask yourself what you really care about, really, because usually that answer will be very different from, usually, if you ask yourself, what do I care about, you'll come up with some answer. And then if you ask yourself, really? Is that really what I care about? Not really, right? It's usually some kind of politically correct answer that we tell ourselves. If you iterate on that, if you keep asking yourself what you care about, and not accepting the previous answer, you just ask again, ask again, eventually you may get to something that you really care about. Okay, so in the middle of a really long project, uh, even with all this stuff going on, you may still get real tired and want to quit. Um, there's two ways of dealing with this, and one is vacation, and the other is working breaks, and they're both useful. I've used both of them. So the worst thing to do is not do either of these. The worst possible thing to do on a long project is you feel tired, you don't want to work on the game today, but you've got to do it because, you know, you're an independent developer, and if you don't do this stuff, nobody's going to do it and the game will never get done, right? And that's the story you tell yourself. And the worst part about that story is it's true, right? If you don't do this work, the game will never get done. But the burden of an indie developer is that you have to tell yourself that and deal with that every day. And at some point, you just need a break from it, right? So the worst possible thing is to not take that break, is to say, oh, I've got to work this weekend because, man, we just haven't got that much done lately, so I'm just going to work really hard this weekend. And then you go and ostensibly start working it again. You instead open the web browser and go to Twitter or something, right? And then you feel miserable because you're on Twitter and you're supposed to be working and you're ostent you know, you're spending the time in the posture that you would if you were working, but you're not getting anything done and you're just 
making your life worse, right? And because you're making your life work life worse, the next day it gets harder, right? You start a rolling snowball of harder and harder. At some point, you need an escape valve from that. So one is you take a real vacation, even if it's just a weekend or two. You go somewhere, you don't think about the game at all. That's a good technique. Another thing that I've done quite successfully is a working break where I'm excited about some other idea that's smaller than my original idea. And I'll just sit down and, and try it out and just make a little game, sort of like you might in a game jam, but in a more committed way. So while uh, Braid was in progress, I actually took two months off. Part of that was real vacation, and part of that was a working break where I made these two games on the left. These games are very different from each other. Um, and they both implement ideas that I was very excited about at the time. Not exactly that deep from the deepest part of the heart love kind of excited, but they were interesting. And I built them, and they're complete games. You can actually download them from my website. Um, the game on the right is a game called Ernesto RPG. You can play a prototype of it on Congregate. The full version is not released yet. Uh, that's by my friend Daniel ben Mergui, And uh, he was working on a very ambitious game called Storyteller. And at some point, he said, oh, I need, I need a break, you know? And over Christmas time, he went and started this very simple game, and he just loved it. And so he's cranking away on it, right? And the, the thing about a working break is when you're doing a long project, if you're on year three of a project, or even two, if you've never done a long project, this might even happen after six months, you've been toiling on it for so long that you sort of forget what the joy of creativity is. Like, why am I even doing this thing? What am I in game development for? I was really excited about all this stuff a long time ago, but now I barely remember that excitement, right? And so what a little working break can do is give you that excitement back. If you choose a very small game and something tractable and you actually finish it and put it out there in the world and see people interact with it, that is a really cool thing to do to sort of get a little of that energy back, to sort of see, yes, this is what game development is about. Now, there's a very fine line here <laughs> between doing this for real and successfully and the thing that a lot of indies do, which is that cascade of sort of starting one project and not finishing it and abandoning it for another and abandoning it for another, right? So you don't want to do that. You want to be very, very careful. Um, so the sort of facetious rule I've got at the bottom here is you're only allowed to take a break to work on a side project that's smaller than something that you've already shipped. So if you've never shipped anything, you're not allowed to do this at all. Start small. OK, um, sort of the l last big psychological problem that happens in a long project is the illusion of no project, of no progress. You're like on year three, and you're looking at your work, and you're like, oh, we're s not only are we so far from being done, but like if I look at where the game was a year ago, we don't even feel like we're that much further, right? How are we ever going to get anything done under those conditions? Um, and really, the best uh, antidote for that is before that ever, ever happens, from the start of the project, you establish momentum, strong productivity. You be fast at what you do and you work hard, right? And that way, by the time you reach this spot where you're a little bit less motivated, you at least can look back and say, oh, but, you know, I'm kind of tired right now, but yeah, like, we really got a lot done. So because we got a lot done, we're going to get more done later so I can, like, it's okay to take this break and all that, right? Um, and, and the other benefit of this is, again, you get this clear out effect. As long as you work hard and productively, um, you clear out those old ideas, which, again, opens that window so that the new creative ideas can pop in. So really, <laughs> be good at what you do is sort of my advice here, right? Um, it's worth, it's worth a lot to be good at what you do. Um, now again, there's a cultural weirdness here because a lot of the time, people don't aim high with their skills. And I, I never understood this. Like in, in programming culture, you get the opposite sometimes where everybody thinks they're the best programmer in the world, um, which is annoying and, and stupid in some ways. But there's ways in which that's actually a very healthy attitude because it, it gets you to work hard and be, be good at what you do and always strive to be better, right? And that's very valuable. Like, if you're going to do a long project, the better you are, the better it'll be, the better your quality of life during the project will be. And 
there's something cultural where a lot of people don't think they're allowed to presume that they'll be able to be one of the best in the world at what they do. Like, oh, I'll never be best, one of the best programmers in the world, or it's ridiculous to think I would be one of the best 3D modelers in the world. Well, it's, it's actually not true. Um, the average, if you look, if you go out and, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to say this without saying something mean. Um, but I'll, I'll just cut it short and say the average is not that good. So it's, it's pretty easy to be better than average, whether it's better than average programmer or better than average model or whatever, right? And because it's not hard to be better than average, it's not that hard to be better than better than average. And it's not that hard to be better than better than better than average. Like each step is only incremental, right? And if you, if you work uh, hard enough, which is not even all that hard, and you are interested enough in being very good, you can in fact be very, very good. You can be world class naturally after like a few years of work. That's just how it is in all of game development right now, which is pretty exciting. Um, but no matter how good you are, you want to pick a project that has, if you want to do deep work, right, you want to pick a project that has an implementation baseline that is well within your abilities, right? And what I mean by that is, you know, that first game that I did, the, the hover tank science fiction war game, I did that with a, a small team. It was one other programmer and one other artist, and it was sort of all we could do to get that game running and get it running fast enough on people's PCs and like, you know, debug it all the time and, and keep, you know, adding features was hard. Back in 1998, that was like at the very limit of what we could have expected to do. And because the, the baseline was so high, we could barely do anything over the baseline, right? Whereas with Braid, when I started that game, I said, okay, look, after that first game, I even had this history of of doing all these technically ambitious projects that I never finished because they were technically ambitious. So I'm gonna do a 2D platformer because I can do that in my sleep. That's easy to program. And that'll give me lots of room to do interesting work as a designer because I want to explore design ideas. And that's why Braid worked. Um, even so, you have to be careful because you'll still underestimate how difficult it is, right? Braid still took a long time and I actually got some friends to help me finish the programming at the end because there was so much to do, even just in a 2D platformer. Um, but because I chose that strategy, I was still able to do a lot of interesting design work. Whereas if that game had been a lot harder to make as a baseline, I wouldn't have been able to do much that was very interesting or deep. So be careful about the project you pick, right? My current game, The Witness, is much bigger and more ambitious than Braid. That works because I have a lot of people helping me out, right? As a single person project, I would never be able to make The Witness. It just wouldn't be possible. So anyway. That's about all that I have to say for today. Um, I know it's a little bit of a weird uh, talk that's, that's gone to some strange places, but my overall goal has been to present an honest picture of the things that I really do from day to day. Like, this is really how I do creativity, right? These are the, the skills that I really think are important. And from day to day, I really like monitor my psychology. That's one of the primary things that I do. How am I doing today? Why am I feeling that way? What can I do about this, right? Um, and I, th I think that's really key to surviving difficult development schedules. And so I hope, um, you know, it's at least my impression that these days, if you learn about game development by reading websites or, you know, you go to school, they teach you this very industrialized picture of game development, right? Um, and I don't like that industrialized picture of game development. It is definitely true that that's a big thing, and most games are developed that way, but I think most of the games developed that way are pretty bad, and it's actually, um, or, or lacking in certain fundamental ways, and the ways in which they are lacking are similar to the ways in which many modern products of industrialized creativity processes are lacking. So, you know, I also happen to think that most movies that come out of Hollywood are relatively vacuous, right? How do you fix that? You don't fix that within that kind of a process, right? You have to go outside that industrialized process, and you have to be your own force for creativity. So that's my perspective. You're free to accept it. You're free to reject it. No matter what, thank you uh, for listening to me today. And I guess that's it. We probably don't have time for questions. We went over time. I, 
I think we can do a question, right? If you're up for it. Sure. Yeah, okay. If we have time. That's the first hand. Hi. Hey. All right. Uh, might be a bit loud. All right. That's good. Right. It's fine. Yeah. All right. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk. It was very inspiring and quite unusual, as most of the time people talk about. Uh, well more technical subjects instead of this more uh, psychological approach to uh, game development in general. And um, this is kind of a personal question. Uh, if you don't want to answer it, that's fine. But I um, was thinking as for, uh, you've told, uh, uh, for example, an indie game movie and some other stuff, uh, kind of the difficult time you had after Raid actually released. Yeah. Um, and how that I was thinking how this kind of reflects back in your current talk because uh, you're putting a lot of effort and um, emotion into uh, this work and it's yeah well very hard uh, to work on a game for so long and have this long development cycle it's kind of psychologically tiring in a way and if that game releases and in a way this is I believe also kind of reflected in Braid itself when you have worked on something for so long, striving for the goal, and people don't receive it in the way you thought it would be received, or it isn't appreciated as you hoped you'd be, how do, how do you handle that? Because, yeah, you had kind of a difficult time afterwards. Well, so the thing, you know, it's a little bit, I think, misunderstood, that part of Indie Game, the movie, right? Because it comes across as though I'm disappointed in the way that, like, the public receive the game, which is actually not true. Um, you know, anytime you release a game to a large body of people, you're going to get a very wide spectrum of responses, right? Um, people will understand it to different levels, and in fact, Braid is constructed intentionally, so you can have different levels of engagement with it and different understandings depending on how interested you are in the game. The thing that I sort of had the problem with um, was that, like, you know, not even the supposed game critics who are all smart and stuff seem to understand very much about the game. Like, I know that there were individual players out there who did. Like, I've, I've gone on forums, like I went on a forum one time, you know, where, where people were talking about what the game was, and so someone said, well, what do you think it's about? And some guy replied, it was like, it, his reply was, was, I think it's, and then like eight one-syllable words where I read those words and I was like, you know what, that is a better description of what the game is about than I would have ever thought, right? And that's a very magical moment to see that, right? Uh, but not everybody's gonna have that response. And I sort of, I naively presumed um, before the game came out that sort of the people in the know, right, the people who are this um, guardians of taste, right, game critics, would really understand the game really well and appreciate it. And they appreciated it, they liked the game, but the things they liked about it were not necessarily the things that I worked very hard to do. I mean, there were things that I that I did, but but I worked really hard on things that were not commented upon in, in the critical dialogue like at all, right? And so it makes you feel a little bit lonely if what you're trying to do, right? So, so one of the things that I was doing with Raid was saying, hey, Here's this kind of thing. Because to that, that point, there weren't very many games that were trying to be this sort of like unfiltered emotional expression, right? Um, I mean, such things probably existed, but I couldn't even have thought of any at the time. So part of the objective of Raid was to say, hey, you can do this in a game, right? Hey, everybody else, don't you think that this thing is cool? And, and what the this that you can do is actually a very complicated thing. And, um, it's difficult to then feel like, you know, you hear crickets coming back uh, in response to that. But the other thing to understand is that um, the internet is not a very good medium for gauging how people have understood your thing. I think it's actually a worse medium than previous, um, previous media. I don't know. I mean, I can speculate on that for a long time. But yeah, it's hard. It's not, it's not easy, and everybody will have a different response to it. Um, but just because something may be difficult doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, right? So. 
Thank you. Sure. Okay, we're gonna do one more question. Um, Hi, Jonathan, my name's Adam. Hey. Uh, my question is about, so you talked about the psychological management that goes into your everyday life and how you're creating these games. And I was wondering if you ever thought about making a game about that process. Uh, um, I couldn't quite hear that, so I'll repeat the question in case anyone else couldn't hear it. Uh, I heard it, but, uh, so the, the question was, have I ever tried to make, thought of making a game about this psychological management kind of thing? And the answer is not really, that's not how ideas go for me. Like a lot of people try to make games that way. Like I have this idea that I want to express like what it's like to show up at a new school and not know anybody there, to just pick some random thing, right? That's a totally a plausible thing that somebody decides that they might want to make an art game about. What I find is when you do that, there's some very early examples that did that. So Rod Humble's game, The Marriage, is a game about being in a marriage. And it's something that I refer to a lot when talking about art games. But I find that at least when I specifically try to do something like that, I'm not that interested in the result. It's like, OK, I can make this thing symbolize this. And I can make this interaction symbolize this other thing. And at the end of that, it's just not something that is as compelling to me as this other kind of stuff that I do. So I, I don't do it, uh, which is not to say that other people couldn't do an amazing job of it, right? But it doesn't seem to be my personal style, right? So that, you know, if you want to make games that are, you know, interesting and, and deep in some way, you kind of have to find what works for you, right? In, in other fields, it's better mapped out, it's better explored, right? If you're a novelist, you can read books by a bunch of novelists in different styles. And there's been thousands of years of iteration on how to write stories. And so there's a lot of different things to choose from. And you might find something that really resonates with you and say, oh, I want to write stuff like that. You know, um, We don't really have that in games yet, because games are really new. So you, you kind of, there's a little bit of that, but it's not nearly the same variety. And so you have to work to find your thing. And that's not my thing, that's all. We done? Okay, let's give Jonathan a great Thank you applause. very much.